Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. We all cherish our memories, and some say they can never be taken away. But what happens when your memories don't match up to reality? That is what we're going to explore here tonight, as I present two stories of men who thought they knew their past. But each received a very shocking wake-up call that may or may not be paranormal in origin, but both are definitely unexplained. Remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't have to rely on your memory to meet here every Thursday for the gathering of the Family of Darkness. It's always a party when you're here with us. So sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared. Together, 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 together. Most people I share this story with cry fake or think I'm insane. Hopefully, I'll get some real answers here, though. So I'm currently 21 years old, and up until recently, I had not experienced anything that I would ever call supernatural. I'm still not sure what I think about the supernatural and paranormal, but this has really freaked me out. I don't know what brought it on, but I was out with friends one night and I suddenly started thinking about my past. In particular, about a childhood friend named Brendan. We went to elementary and middle school together, and when I was remembering this, I just assumed that we had gone to different high schools and then drifted apart so I decided that I was going to track him down and reconnect. But I couldn't find any of his social media accounts or any information about him at all online, so I sort of forgot about it for a while. Then, about a month ago, I was out with another of my friends, Amy, whom I've also known since elementary school, and I asked her if she remembered Brendan and if she knew how to get in touch with him. She seemed confused at first, but when I mentioned his last name, she remembered him. She said she hadn't spoken to him in maybe eight years, but she remembered his parents' address, so I drove over there. His parents opened the door, and I recognized them. They said hi, invited me inside, and remarked about how much I'd grown. I asked about Brendan, and here is where the story begins. They said, they didn't have a son. I immediately assumed that maybe he had gotten into drugs or something and they had disowned him. But no, they insisted that they do not now nor have they ever had a son, just two daughters whom I vaguely remembered and recognized. But there's no doubt this was Brendan's family. After some back and forth, I ended up outright accusing them of lying and they got very defensive, so I apologized and went home. I don't think I got the wrong house. I recognized them, and they recognized me. But regardless, I phoned Amy and told her what happened, and I asked her if she was sure that that was their address. I stopped thinking about it for a little while, until about two weeks ago. Amy texted me, saying that Brendan wasn't in any of her school yearbooks, and sure enough, I checked mine, and he's not there. Confused, we met up a few days ago, and we both went into separate rooms to draw what we thought Brendan looked like, just in case this was a shared hallucination. But no, we both came back with drawings that looked almost the same, down to the way he parted his hair and the location of his three facial moles, and these were very distinctive facial moles. So in the past few days, we've been going down a rabbit hole of talking to old teachers, friends, etc. And I swear to God, it's like Brendan never existed. We even went back to our old middle school to see if he was in any class photos and nothing. I also got some old birthday photos from my mom. And on most of these birthdays, I am 100% certain that Brendan was there at the parties. But again, no photos of him. My parents don't even remember him. 
and we were close friends for years. Amy and I want to check hospital records for some kind of birth certificate or anything, as it's really starting to scare us both. Is there some kind of explanation for this, supernatural or otherwise? If it were just me, I'd think I'd dreamed him up, but Amy pointed out the correct address of his parents, and we both came up with near-identical drawings of him. I don't think we're mistaking him for someone else either, because his facial moles are really distinctive, and he got bullied for them in elementary school. Update number one. I'll keep updating this post with information as the search continues. I'll also answer questions that keep popping up in the comments section as I go. Amy and I are planning to go back to his parents' house tomorrow so that we can ask more questions and show them the sketches that we did. We're now exploring the possibility that Brendan was a foster child, and we want to take a look at his bedroom. Also, I've become aware that birth certificates are public record, so I'll be looking for his birth certificate tomorrow. At this point, I don't know if he's a missing person or if he never existed at all. Should I possibly talk to the police? I'm not sure. Update number two. A lot of people are theorizing that Brendan is trans, and that's why his parents insist that they had two daughters. But I don't think that's the case. Brendan did have two sisters, so if he transitioned, then his parents would have said they had three daughters. Someone else suggested that Amy and I draw a map of his room in the house, so that when we go there we can again test to make sure that this isn't a shared hallucination. But Amy doesn't remember the exact layout of the entire house, but she does say that she remembers which side of the room his closet and bedroom window were on, so we'll be comparing that instead. Also, on the topic of going back to the house again, some people said they don't think I should, as his parents may get angry. No, his parents do like me. They do remember who I am, but according to them, I was just a friendly neighborhood kid who babysat for their daughters, not their son's friend. Which is strange because I don't remember ever babysitting in my life. So I don't think they'll be offended to see me again, despite how our last interaction went. Some people don't believe that both Amy and I remembered Brendan's moles, but trust me, they were very big and very distinctive. Others are talking about similar stories that they've seen online. Please link them. And if anything like this has happened to you, message me. Any help at all finding an explanation for this would be very much appreciated. Update number three. So we went back to visit Brendan's parents and told them that we'd been looking for Brendan and what we remembered. I'm pretty sure they thought we were crazy but they did cooperate. We showed them the sketches that we did and asked them if they ever had a foster child. Nothing. They agreed to let me tour the house, but not Amy. I guess because they didn't know her. Turns out Amy and I were right about the location of his bedroom window and the closet. But his parents say it's only been a storage room. There isn't a single photo of him in the house either. I don't think his parents are lying. They honestly don't seem to think that they have a son. I also asked them more about our relationship, how they know me and how I know them. But they didn't give me any new information, just that I babysat and helped around the house. That was it. Because of corona, we won't be going to the hospitals near us anytime soon, but birth certificates are public record, so maybe there'll be some way to check. We've already contacted old teachers and classmates, and they don't know anything about Brendan either. I'm sorry I don't have any answers. A lot of you have been proposing theories about alternate timelines, and as much as a skeptic as I am, I'm starting to believe that this may be some kind of case of timeline jumping. Also, I've sent my mom the drawings that we did, and I'll update this when she responds back. Some people were understandably skeptical that Amy and I could both draw, but we both attended art classes together, so we can draw. Plus, Amy is indeed real. 
I've seen her have conversations with other people, and people know who I'm talking about when I talk about Amy, so unless everyone that I know is fake, which is not the case, then Amy is 100% real. Update number four. So I'm pretty much at a dead end, and I think it may be time to give up. A lot of you put forth an alternate timeline theory, and I'm sort of leaning towards that as the answer, but there's no real way to know for sure. I apologize that this story doesn't have any real conclusion, but I guess that's just how it is. My mom did get back to me, and we've been texting back and forth for the past hour and a half. She said she had no idea who this person is that Amy and I drew. I also brought up the babysitting to her, and she says she does remember me occasionally doing that. I have no memory of that at all. Some people have tried to poke holes in my story, and I guess that's understandable. I didn't expect this post to garner so much attention, and I left out some details intentionally. So, to address your concerns, 1. How did we both A. Remember what he looked like eight years ago, and B. Have the artistic skills to draw him? Amy and I both attended university-level art classes, and we know how to render a human face. And as stated before, Brendan's facial markings and moles are very distinctive, and that's why we remembered them. 2. Why are his parents okay with me coming over repeatedly? Well, they weren't entirely okay with Amy being there, but they do like me. I acknowledge that I was a little intrusive both times, but I don't think they would suddenly do a 180 and never allow me back again. 3. How did Brendan and I not stay in contact after middle school? We were inseparable in elementary school, but started to drift apart in middle school. I guess we just stopped putting in the effort, and once we went to different high schools, it ended there. To further separate us, partway through my freshman year, Mom and I moved across town. I can already see why people would be confused now that I live near his parents again. To answer that question in advance, I now live on campus, so I'm sort of near their house again. 4. This reads like fiction. I'm not sure how to explain that one. Maybe I'm just a good storyteller. Backdoor fiction. 5. How can you run around like this in the middle of a pandemic? Well, I have to admit, I haven't really been taking social distancing too seriously. Nobody in my area is, really. Most schools are still open here, but with a reduced schedule. 6. This sounds like a post I read X amount of time ago. If multiple timelines is a real thing, it wouldn't surprise me that there's a lot of these things posted. So, of course, it would make its way to the internet. 7. You're copying and pasting answers. Well, a lot of people are asking the same questions, and with so many people to respond to, it's a lot easier to just cut and paste. I'm sorry if it comes across as disingenuous. I just don't want to ignore anyone. And finally, 8. Why use a throwaway Reddit account? People in my real life know about my main Reddit account name, so I don't want it attached to my main Reddit account, because they may think I'm crazy. This is my first post on Reddit, but I really felt like I had to share my experience with someone, and I chose to do it here because, frankly, I don't think anyone in my real life will take it seriously. This story begins nine years ago, in Montreal, Canada, in 2011. I was in my second year studying psychology at Concordia University, going for my Bachelor of Arts degree. I've always been a very nerdy, geeky guy. I'm confident in myself, but very timid in public. During that winter semester, I was taking four psychology courses plus a film studies course as all students were required to take a mandatory elective outside of their major. To be honest, 
I thought the class would be easy and a way to add to my credits and lighten my study load. There were around 70 of us in the class, all coming from different backgrounds, with no specific knowledge of cinema. I didn't know anyone else there, but I really didn't care. The class met once a week, on Wednesdays, from 6 to 9 p.m. The class met in a very large and impersonal classroom, where the professor didn't really get to know any of us. Actually, he never even called us by name, not once, not even to take attendance. We were asked to put our signature beside our name on a list that he kept at his desk. This turns out to be a very important detail to the story. On the second meeting of the class, a girl sat beside me and we started to chat. I instantly thought she was cool. She had a really nice vibe and we quickly became friends. She told me her name was Ida Robertson. She was studying to become a nurse, but was still searching for herself and wasn't sure if that was what she really wanted to do with her life. But she was passionate about the cinema, like me, and that's why she got into the class. Ida was very funny, and I made her laugh as well. She was about my age, 22 at the time, and an American. Every Wednesday, we naturally sat together again. I felt like we were both very happy to see one another, and we instantly joked and laughed. We had a kind of strange instant chemistry, like we'd already known each other for years. Let me be clear, I'm gay, and we were both attracted to men, so this was all about the friendship, nothing more. We often made comments about guys together, and I think that probably made us connect even more. Ida and I became good friends. She was spontaneous, which I liked a lot. Also, she didn't have any social media accounts, which I thought was pretty interesting and cool. Actually, she told me she used to have a Facebook profile, but deleted it a couple of months before we met because she thought it was too time-consuming, which made me admire her even more. We never really saw each other outside a film class, but we communicated often via text message. We'd send a lot of jokes and pictures and stuff back and forth, or write emails when it was about something more serious, like class-related activities. All my other friends only knew Ida as my film class friend. They never met her. I talked about her a lot to them, though, praising her sense of humor, and I'd like to think that she was saying the same thing about me to her friends. We were good together. Our personalities were kind of like a perfect match. A couple of weeks before the end of the semester, our professor gave us instructions for our final project. It was to be a simple analysis of any international movie, and we had the possibility to team up in pairs, so Ida and I naturally decided to do it together. Choosing to do it as a team rather than alone actually doubled the project length, but whatever. 20 pages still sounded pretty easy to me, to be honest. I'm usually not a fan of teaming up for class projects, but I knew I would have fun with Ida. Plus, she suffered from dyslexia, which made it a lot more difficult for her to make herself understood with the written word. She had a hard time doing past written assignments, so I thought I would be a good friend and help her out with this one. We chose to write our analysis on a well-known Japanese anime, Spirited Away. We both became real fans of the film and started working on our respective parts of the assignment. We worked together very well and we were sending each other memes and photos and montages of anime characters all the time. For the analysis, I was in charge of fact-checking and merging our two written papers into one cohesive whole. When I received her part before the deadline, I was in shock. Her dyslexia was no secret, but seriously, I couldn't understand a single sentence. Nothing made sense. We spoke on the phone and she admitted that when she tried to read her own writing back, it was pretty much useless. I had to rewrite her whole part of our project from scratch myself, trying to put what she had in her mind on the paper. It was very frustrating, but hey, we were friends, so no worries. So I rewrote the whole thing, put both of our names on it, then we both went together to drop off our final project with the professor. We felt proud and confident about our paper, but a little sad that we'd be ending our weekly meetings. 
We wound up at the university bar, talking almost all night and drinking. Each of us went home tipsy, and we texted each other on and off throughout the following week. Two weeks after class ended, I received a personal email from my professor, whom I'd never had any personal contact with outside of class before. He probably didn't even know what I looked like. He said Ida and I got an A on the film study analysis, but that he was having trouble finding my partner on his student list, and Ida's ID number, the one that she'd written on the paper, seemed invalid. He said he needed her information in order to enter her marks into the system. I thought that was weird and took responsibility for it at first, as I was the one who wrote her name on the document. So I double-checked what was written on the cover page as opposed to what she had sent me via email. But they were identical. Maybe Ida herself made the mistake when she sent me her information. I tried to text her and ask her for her ID number, but I never got a reply. A couple of days later, the professor contacted me again and insisted that he had checked his student list, and according to him, there was no Ida Robertson registered to his course, nor any Ida or anyone named Robertson in the entire university database. At first, I thought Ida may have been confused and taken an entire course that she never registered for. But every single class, I clearly saw her confirm her presence by signing that student list. I'm absolutely sure about it. We even did it together a couple of times. I tried to reach Ida over the following days and weeks. My emails started to bounce back, and she never replied to my text messages. At that point, I didn't really care anymore about the homework thing. I just needed to understand. I tried calling her directly, but a man's voice answered. The number was for a pizza parlor in Griffintown, and they claimed that they had that number for the past 20 years, and they couldn't have received any text messages on it because it was a landline. But that didn't make any sense as I'd been texting her the entire semester on that number, and it was registered in my contacts list, so I hadn't misdialed. I never heard from her again, and it's always been for me that weird story of Ida, my friendship with a girl that lasted only a semester, then disappeared. We didn't have any friends in common, and no one I knew actually saw her. There were no clues, Nothing else to help me understand what might have happened to her. I can't understand why she would have lied to me, or how to explain the whole phone number thing. For years, it stayed just like that. A weird memory. Until recently. Sunday, May 10th, to be precise. I was having a Skype conversation with my brother's girlfriend for Mother's Day. We don't know each other very well, but she's the mother of my two nieces, and we get along reasonably well. Her name is Laura. She's 52, 23 years older than me, and from Vermont. She's currently living in the suburbs of Montreal with my brother and their children. While Laura and I were making small talk, we somehow got talking about kids who run away from home. I think a friend of my niece tried to run away. Anyway, Laura and I were talking about runaways and she was telling me how worried and scared she would be if one of her daughters just disappeared. That brought up the subject of a girl she knew back when she was in her early 20s, who ran away, never to be seen again. The girl who disappeared was a colleague of hers. Both worked as nurses at the time. Laura said her name was Ida Robertson. She then went on to describe Ida to me, and it was the same Ida that I knew at Concordia University in 2011. But according to Laura, this happened in 1989, and they both worked at the Grace Cottage Hospital. Laura said she was shocked because no one seemed to care that Ida went missing. She felt like she was the only one who was worried about her. I freaked out when I heard this story. My head and ears started to pound. I couldn't really share any of this with Laura because she wouldn't understand. It's just too bizarre. How can it be the same person, 22 years apart, 
Yet the girl that I met was only in her early 20s when we met in 2011. I feel like I have to understand this for myself first before sharing this with anybody in my real life because I'm starting to doubt my own perceptions and memories. I wonder, are my memories just twisted? The timelines don't match, obviously, but how can two Ida Robertsons in the nursing field both disappear around the age of 20, 22 years apart? Am I crazy? Do any of you have an explanation? I realize no one actually saw Ida. I only spoke to my friends about her. They never actually met her or spoke to her on the phone. I used to have a history of the text messages that we shared, even though the number did weirdly become a pizza place. Unfortunately, I changed phones long ago, and nothing remains of those messages. I have no idea what to do, who to tell, or what to look for. Does Ida Robertson ring a bell with any of you guys? Any theories that could help me out and give me a little peace of mind would be very much appreciated. Such confusing stories. I contacted both posters and each expressed a desire and hope that sharing their stories would lead to a wider audience and possibly to getting some answers. So if any of you have any ideas or leads, please leave a comment below and we'll see if together we can solve a mystery or two. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll be sent a weekly invitation to the party. But as always, gate crashers are also most welcome. And I love you as much as I do my official family of darkness. You're my prodigal darklings. And I hope that one day you do decide to officially join the family so you never forget to come every week. But for now, until next time, stay scared, my friends. <laughs>